calling the defendant, then that seems to be a waste of all of tomorrow. So I think we should kind of get some idea whether or not that's happened. Um, I'm prepared to do a cross of him immediately after his direct. So it just seems to waste a whole day of Tuesday. It doesn't make a lot of sense. Mr. Manship. I, I mean, we would like to present our case in a, in a certain order. And uh, we wouldn't want to have to be forced to, to do it out of that order. Forcing you to do it out of order. I just, I'm just curious. I just want to know about the. You're the one who brought the planning or the scheduling. I want to know what is it you anticipate doing tomorrow if the state rests today. Not presenting any evidence. And, uh, and doing and doing what in the alternative though? I mean, what? So we're just not going to work at all tomorrow. If, I'm not going to be at the beach, um, but. Uh, I, mean, I, I, I figured that. Just, I want to know what we're going to do with our time and the jurors' time tomorrow. I'm, I'm not. Uh, Spare me the comment about the I, beach. I apologize, Judge. That was inappropriate. Uh, we we could certainly do uh, jury instructions, JOA argument. Um, I. It, it's all things that I don't think that we actually need the jury here for. And when you were when you were talking to them about scheduling, you did indicate to them that there was, it was very likely there was going to be some downtime and that we may not use uh, this entire week. Um, and we're, we're still on pace to finish this week. We're still on pace to have a verdict this week uh, for guilt. So I, I don't really think that it's, it's um, and um, Oh, okay. <clears throat> I could also explain something else as well. Uh, Ms. Powers, our, our expert that's flying in from Colorado, uh, is, is uh, uh, testifying today uh, in, another, in another trial in Colorado, a murder trial, and uh, getting her here, we, we tried, because we didn't, we didn't want to book her flights also until we had an idea as what the, when the state was actually finishing and uh, because of the, the efficiency and um, we're, uh, I mean, we, we are we are doing good as far as as far as time goes even taking today off without having the jury here we're still going to have a verdict before Friday all right, well, let's see how it goes. I'll try and accommodate everybody, including witnesses, but let's get started with the state's testimony today, and we'll decide what, what, what we do. Okay. I'll try and accommodate everybody as best I can, but I'm reluctant to waste a whole day. I apologize again about my problems. All right, state ready to have the jury? Yes, Your Honor. Defense ready to have the jury come in? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, I think we're ready, Mr. Ross. <clears throat>
Okay, welcome back, everybody. Thanks for bearing with us. We appreciate your patience. I hope you all had a nice weekend. We're ready to push ahead. Mr. Back to you, Carter. Right, time the people of the state of Florida will call Brand King. <laughs> Thanks for bearing with us. You'll come right up here. Miss Leslie will place you under oath, sir. Do you swear upon the evidence you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. We'll step right over to your left, please. Good morning. Good morning, sir. Could you please introduce yourself to the ladies and gentlemen of the jury? Yes, sir. Sergeant Grant King, St. Lucie County Sheriff's Office. And Sergeant King, how long have you been with the Sheriff's Office here in St. Lucie County? I've been employed with St. Lucie County Sheriff's Office since August 1st of 1989. Prior to that, I was with the Baltimore City Police Department in Baltimore, Maryland for 18 months. Okay. Now, can you tell us what your present duties, and, or tell the ladies and gentlemen jury what your present duties and responsibilities are with the Sheriff's Office? Yes, sir. Currently, I'm signed as the Sergeant in charge of the Civil Execution Unit. Um, we serve all the subpoenas that come out of the courthouse, the state attorney's office, the public defenders, and all such paperwork as lawsuits and evictions. Okay. How long have you been in that particular division? Uh, approximately three and a half years, sir. So if I take you back to Thursday morning, February 28, 2013, you were sergeant in the civil division at that time? Yes, sir, I was. And what were your general assignments or duties on that particular day, do you recall? Yes, sir. That day, I was had to go to Longwood Hospital to deliver some subpoenas to some doctors and talk to the staff over there. And when you were at Longwood Hospital, did you, did you become aware of the fact that there had been a shooting involving Sergeant Morales in the Silver Lake Estates area of St. Lucie County? Yes, sir, I did. And while at the hospital, were you present when Sergeant Morales' body was transported uh, to Longwood? Yes, sir. Did you have the occasion then to uh, observe Sergeant Morales uh, at the hospital? Yes, sir, I did. And well at the hospital, did you observe various injuries that he had sustained as a result of this shooting incident? Yes, sir, I did. Can you describe for the ladies and gentlemen of the jury where you observed these injuries on or about Sergeant Morales' body? Yes, sir. I observed that Sergeant Morales was shot in his left arm, his throat, and his head. Now, well at the hospital, obviously, uh, EMT personnel had rendered first aid or attempted to, is that correct? Yes, sir. And they had also attempted to do so at the hospital, is that right? Yes, sir. Well at the hospital, had the items that Sergeant Morales had been wearing that day been removed by either the EMTs or the hospital personnel? Yes, sir, they had. Okay. And obviously, they're not, you know, gingerly removed. Would, would you agree that they're removed by being cut? torn, taken off in the fastest manner possible? Yes, sir, they are. All right. Now, well, you were at the hospital um, with Sergeant uh, Morales and his, his clothing and so forth. Did you begin to collect those items and then ultimately turn them over to the crime scene unit in this car, in this case? Yes, I did. All right. The first thing I'd like to show you is State's Exhibit 29. And I'll ask you if you recognize this, and for the record, this would be, uh, would have been in your evidence room, I guess, as, uh, I can find the number on here. I believe it's St. Lucie SO 29 as well, so the number's actually the same. So, 29, can you take a look at that? Yes, sir. Can you recognize that? Yes, sir, I do. Okay, and, and you, you recognize the, uh, well, let me have you do this. I'm going to have you open State's Exhibit 29 and examine the contents. Yes, sir. 
First of all, with regard to this blue container, do you recognize this? Yes, sir. It was handed to me by the doctor. Okay. And did that contain an item in it? Yes, sir, it did. And what did it contain? It contained a slug removed from Sergeant Morales. Okay. Uh, this is a slug removed from Sergeant Morales' right shoulder? Yes, sir, his right shoulder. Okay. All right, Your Honor, at this time we'd offer into evidence State Exhibit 29. Objection report R. Offense objection be admitted to State's 29 in evidence. And obviously this has been submitted to the local crime lab, is that correct? Yes, sir. And this bullet removed from Sergeant Morales' shoulder, was, did you receive this or obtain it from the surgeon there at the hospital? Yes, sir, I did. Continuing on, I want to show you what's been marked for identification as State's Exhibit uh, 28, which is St. Lucie SO number 25, and ask if you recognize this. Yes, sir. And, and can you go ahead and open the contents of that exhibit? What's in there? There are three belt keepers. Okay, now, did you collect these items at the hospital relative to some of Sergeant Morales' belongings? Yes, sir, I did. And are those the three belt keepers that you collected? Yes, sir. Okay, Your Honor, we'd offer now in the State Exhibit 28. Objection for that? Yes, sir. No. That objection being the State's 28 in evidence. Just remove one for a moment. This is what you referred to as a belt keeper. Do you, can you tell us what you guys use these for? Yes, sir. The belt keeper is designed... To open up, you slide this between your gun belt or over your gun belt and over your belt that holds up your pants. You snap together. It's designed to have, keep both belts together. If not, your gun belt tends to shift and fall. Okay. So it, it, do, you have, do you wear them? Yes, sir. Okay. Can you just kind of show the jury what yes, they are on your belt? My gun belt, I wear them two up front, two in the back, and one all the way behind. Do you have five of them? Yes, sir. I'm not drawing any conclusions from that, but there are only three here. Yes, sir. Officers are let, there is no set procedure on how many they can wear. It's up to the individual deputy or officer to decide how many they need. Next, I want to show you State's Exhibit 30. This is State's Exhibit 30, and it's also St. Lucie Sheriff's Office identification number 30. Do you recognize that exhibit? Yes, sir. Okay, can you just open it and examine the contents? Yes, sir. One of those? Two pair of boots and socks. And again, are those Sergeant Morales' part of Sergeant Morales' uniform that you recovered from the hospital? Yes, sir, it is. Now, defense objection be made to States 30 and evidence. I want to next show you States Exhibit 32. And how do you recognize that? Yes, sir. Okay, and that's going to be St. Lucie County SL 54. Um, if you would open the bag and examine the contents.
examining uh, age exhibit uh, 32, which is the same as the SO 54. Do you recognize this particular item? Yes, sir. Sergeant Morales, is sir. And again, you collected this from the, the hospital, packaged it, correct? Yes, sir. Turned it over to the crime Turned scene. it over to the crime scene, yes, sir. Your Honor, we'd offer an evidence case exhibit 32. Objection. Objection being made, it states 32. Um, does it appear as if, as you had indicated earlier, that the shirt had been cut in, in some fashion, have it removed? Yes, sir. Okay, if you put some gloves on, I'd like you just to hold that up for the jury. Mr. Back up, let me get the clerk to mark the card oh, there, sir. Okay. Uh, he's doing that. Obviously, that contains all of the insignia associated with the St. Lucie County Sheriff's Office? Yes, sir. Okay. His badge? Yes, sir. His name tag? Yes, sir. And the agency insignia? Yes, sir. And what are these stripes here? Sergeant Stripes. Okay. All right. Thank you. So number 57, ask you if you recognize that exhibit. Yes, sir. his uniform pants. Okay, does it also contain his the belt that you were worn? Yes, sir. Okay, so this is not his belt, but his belt that you it's guys just used to hold your pants up. Yes, sir. Okay. And again, does that show signs of having been cut off of uh, Sergeant Morales' body? Yes, sir, it does. Okay. Your Honor, this time we've offered that one state Yes, sir, I do. vest panel. Okay. And this is Sergeant Morales' ballistic vest panel? Yes, sir, it is. And you recovered this from the hospital as well? Yes, sir, I did. Yeah, at this time we'd offer an evidence state's exhibit 34. Okay. If I Without defense objection be admitted to the state's 34. Okay. I'd like 
going to take this out. And Judge, once the sergeant's removed the exhibit, I'd like to ask him to step down in front of the jury. Yes, sir. I'll issue this exhibit. As I've advised you all, anything that's admitted, you'll be able to take back in the jury room with you when you retire. Go ahead, show it to you. So if you'd step down, please. Again, you've identified this as a, as a vest, is that correct? This is a ballistic vest that's worn in our body armor. I'm going to try and get down here in a minute. Yes, sir. And is this the entire vest, or are there pieces of this particular item that are not here with us today? It's missing some pieces. Okay. Can you tell us what part of the vest this is? This is just the back panel of the vest. Okay. You can tell by the way the straps are. Okay. This comes over the shoulder and attached to the front panel of the vest. Okay. So I'm sorry, this would be on your back? Yes, sir. And then what would be here? What's missing from the front part of the vest? There would be a matching vest panel that goes on the front. Okay. And are there any, is there anything, I mean, what are these comprised of, do you know? It's made of Kevlar and sorted materials to stop certain velocities of slugs. Okay. On the front part of the vest panel, is there an additional piece of protection in that particular part of the vest? Yes, sir. Some of them have what's called a trauma plate. It's a metal plate alloy that covers your heart and your midsection. Okay. And so then again, there would be kind of a matching part to this, but with the, I guess, the part that would have the soft Velcro, if you will. Yes, sir. Okay. All right. Thank you. States Exhibit 31, which also has the St. Louis County SOID number 31. I ask if you recognize that. Yes, sir, I do. Okay. And if you could, please open that box. Yes, sir, I do. And what is contained within States Exhibit 31? Sergeant Morales' gun belt. And this is as you recovered it from the <clears throat> hospital, correct? Yes, sir. Your Honor, at this time, the state would offer an evidence to States Exhibit 31. Yes, sir. Yes. Well, defense objection to be admitted to States 31 in evidence. If you would just go ahead and remove the item from the box, and I'll give the box to the clerk. Start off with that. What what are we looking at here? This is the portable radio that deputies carry. This is just the battery for it. It's just been disconnected on the back of it. And we can see, obviously, as you turn around, you've got one on your hip. Is that correct? Yes, sir, I do. All right, but it's also connected to a microphone. Is that right? Yes, sir. All right, and can this one be connected to a microphone as well? Yes, sir. All right. All right. And if you hold up. The bell itself. And how about if I do this and then I'll have you identify the items on it? Okay. So go ahead and tell the jury what, what we have on Sergeant Morales. This is a magazine pouch that carries two extra magazine loads for his duty weapon. And they, are they in there? Yes, sir, they are. Okay. This is a, I think it's called AS, which is a manufacturer. It's, it's this expandable baton that the deputies are issued. This is his holder for. His radio. This is a holder for one of the big flashlights we carry. This is a pouch that carries a pair of uh, rubber gloves and usually a um, CPR mask. This is a holder that carries our pepper spray. 
This is the holster for the duty weapon, and this is the magazine, or excuse me, the handcuff holder and handcuffs. Okay. Now we talked with some of your fellow deputies about how this particular gun belt operates. Can you just, do you have the same type gun belt on your, or excuse me, gun holder on your belt? Yes, sir. All right, and can you just show us again how one would go about, what, what actions one would have to take to remove the firearm? Remove the firearm, you have to depress this button on the top, you have to depress it down and roll it forward. And you have to depress the locking mechanism on the side to lift your weapon out. Okay. So you got a couple of safety mechanisms you got to yes, do before you can get the firearm out? Yes, sir. Okay. <coughs> And again, we can see that you had to go through some effort to open those items. Those all were turned over to the Sheriff's Office for examination, either by your agency or the crime lab. Is that correct? Yes, sir. I can just have one moment, Your Honor. Yes, sir. Uh, do y'all need him to stay or can he be no, released? No, he may be released, Your Honor. Okay, with the defense to release him. Fine. You're free to go, sir. Thank you. You're welcome to stay, of course, if you wish. Just watch stepping down. Stay call our next witness, please. Yes, sir. Your Honor, at this time, the state would call Richard Young to the stand. <clears throat> with us. Uh, just watch your step there. Okay. Here's your place. Your Do you swear upon the evidence you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. So I'm going to step right up to your left. Can I just have one moment, Your Honor? Yes, sir. Good morning. Would you please introduce yourself to the ladies and gentlemen of the jury? My name is Richard Thomas Young. And Mr. Young, how are you presently employed? I'm retired. Before you, when, when, when did you retire? Uh, this past July. All right. And prior to your retirement, what did you do for an occupation? I worked for the St. Lucie Sheriff's Office. And, sir, how long were you employed with the St. Lucie County Sheriff's Office? Just shy of 30 years. Can you tell us when you, uh, before you retired, what position did you hold within that agency? I was a detective with the crime scene unit. And how long were you there in the crime scene unit of the sheriff's office? A little over 10 years. All right. Prior to that, since you have a, did, I didn't ask you, but do you have a prior law enforcement experience outside of the St. Louis County Sheriff's Office? No. All right. So prior to the 10 years you spent with the crime scene unit, what other positions and job descriptions did you hold within that agency? I was a, a road patrol deputy for approximately 19 and a half years. And during the time that you're on road patrol, can I assume, as I think we've all learned now, road patrol kind of is the jack of all trades, if you will, within the agency? Yes. <laughs> can we assume that you had the occasion to respond to crime scenes as an initial responder? Yes. Okay, so other than your experience with, I guess, observing and examining crime scenes as a crime scene specialist, would you estimate a number of how many, let's say, violent-type crime scenes you might have been to during your 19 years on the road? Uh, I'd say probably 50, 60. Right. With respect to your duties and training, can you give us a, a description of your educational background, training, and experience, and kind of focus for the benefit of the jury on those classes that focus more on your crime scene duties and responsibilities? Sure, I've got... Uh, or 1,100 hours of uh, crime scene-related courses, uh, some of which include 
um, crime scene reconstruction, homicide investigation, shooting reconstruction. Uh, I have numerous fingerprint uh, courses. I've also uh, taken some photography courses, uh, evidence processing, evidence collection, just to name a few. I'm also certified as a crime scene analyst through the International Association for Identification. Now, during your tenure just in crime scene, uh, the ten years you've been, were in that division with the agency, do you have any estimation as to how many crime scenes specifically involved in shootings you had either processed or assisted in the processing of? Uh, probably around 125. Not something you keep exact numbers on? Yes, I don't. When you retired from the crime scene, how many other crime scene investigators were within, with the agency? Two. What I would like you to do for the benefit of this jury is kind of just take us through the process from the first point at which you're called out to a scene as a crime scene investigator <laughs> through what you do upon arrival and, and up and through the conclusion of your responsibilities in the investigation of a crime scene. Okay. My duties when I get to a crime scene is to document the scene. Uh, normally when I first get there, I'm going to talk to the initial deputy or detective that's on scene, uh, get a gist of what's going on, uh, talk to maybe some witnesses if they um, have seen something. Uh, but normally I get most of my information from the detective or deputy. Uh, at that point, my job is to document the scene, so I'm going to take photographs. Uh, mark evidence. If it needs processing, I'm going to process it for fingerprints. Uh, and then I would collect the evidence. That's the gist of it. And do any diagrams if diagrams need to be done. Okay, so let's break it down just for a moment. When we talk about the importance of talking to witnesses, whether it be a law enforcement witness or a lay witness, why do you want to know what people are saying happened? Why, why is that important to you as a crime scene investigator? Because it gives you a starting point. Uh, it gives you an idea uh, where evidence might be, uh, gives you a chance to prove or disprove uh, any information you might have received. Okay. So it can either corroborate or refute what somebody's telling another law enforcement officer or witness might be telling you? Correct. Right. And the next thing you said is to document, and again, that's done through photographs. Are there other means by which you can document a, a crime scene? Yes, I always write reports. And what about diagrams? On occasion, will you prepare a, a crime scene diagram? That's correct. And the point of documenting locations of evidence and creating diagrams and things of that nature is for what? What are you trying to accomplish? Well, if it ever needs to be reconstructed, you have that information. Now, you had indicated something about processing evidence for fingerprints. Yes. As it relates to your duties and responsibilities as a crime scene investigator with the St. Lucie County Sheriff's Office, what kind of examinations of physical evidence can you do, and where do you do that generally? Uh, normally back at the office, we will do it in a processing room. Uh, our main duty is fingerprints, basically. We try to get fingerprints off of uh, any of the evidence that we collect. Uh, we also might swab for DNA, uh, but anything like that would be sent out to the lab. Okay. So first of all, we have firearms as it relates to the examination functionality. Uh, origin of fired bullets and casing, things of that nature. That is not something you folks do? No. Who does that? The, the lab, the Indian River Crime, uh, County Crime Lab. Right. Another thing you said is you might have a piece of evidence from which you'll collect potential DNA uh, uh, evidence. So, for instance, it could be blood, it could be semen, it could be something of that nature. You would collect that off an item? Yes. Okay. And again, you all do you all do DNA testing at the Sheriff's Office? No, we don't want to test it. Is that also sent off to the Crime Lab? Correct. What about the documentation of the condition of items, such as clothing for tears, rips, uh, things that might be consistent with sharp uh, objects, knives, uh, or, and or bullets, or things of that nature? Do you examine items for that? Yes, we would examine it, and I might photograph it or uh, document where the uh, tears, holes, or, or rips are. Okay, and that particular information, is that useful in assisting you and ultimately reconstructing a crime scene. Yes. And particularly when dealing with a shooting reconstruction, as the location of uh, of some assistance in recreating a shooting incident. Yes. All right. So I'd like to move you to.
to February 28, 2013, and ask you if you recall if you were on duty that particular day. Yes, I was. The morning of Thursday, February 28, what, what was your assignment? What were your duties and responsibilities? I was working crime scene, so uh, we were contacted uh, and responded to, originally responded to uh, Oleander Avenue, uh, where the defendant was uh, taken into custody. All right, so let's, when, when, when we go through your testimony today, fair to say you've got, for lack of a better term, two different scenes, two different crime scenes that you're going to work. That's correct. The first scene that you went to was, again, where? Oleander, uh, by DiGiorgio Road. <clears throat> and did, were photographs taken at that scene? Yes, I did. All right. And I understand that there was also maybe a somebody from the traffic unit that would have come out and assist with crash uh, reconstruction. Yes, the traffic unit um, investigated the crash. So. Okay. Now, at some point in time, they, they, well, when you arrived on the scene, was there a vehicle there? Yes. All right. And can you describe that car? Uh, it was a red Toyota Corolla. Uh, and there was also a Honda Civic Silver and patrol cars. Right. And uh, the Silver Honda Civic, is that the vehicle that was involved in the, after the pit maneuver that was that struck the defendant's vehicle? Yes. All right. After you all conducted the crash reconstruction or, or crash scene investigation, was that Corolla removed from the scene? Yes, it was. All right. And ultimately, where was it transported to? Uh, the St. Lucie Sheriff's Office compound. Your Honor, at this time, if I could, I'd like to have the witness step down. Yes, sir. Well, before I do that, I want to make sure these photographs identified. We're going to show you some photographs, uh, sir. If you please look at them. States Exhibit 36. States Exhibit 37. States. Objection will be admitted as states 36, 37, 38, 39, 41, 42, 43, 44, 45, 47, 48 evidence. Mr. Packard, I can just thank you. Thank you. Mr. Mayor, Yes, I can have him step down. Did I ask for 53 minutes? Do you have a motion to admit the state of 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 the during the course of the processing of the penalty? Yes, it does. State would offer states 53. Okay. Objection to the states 53 in evidence. Okay, Your Honor, if I could have the witness step down. Yes, sir. Just make sure you identify which exact. Uh, yes, sir.
Okay, so the first photograph I'm uh, displaying on the screen is in evidence as State's Exhibit 6 and has previously been identified as the car the defendant was driving at the time of this incident. Do you recognize that? Yes, I do. Okay, and is this the car you referred to that was transported from the Oleander scene back to the Sheriff's Office for processing? That's correct. All right. And prior to processing the vehicle itself, itself, did you document the location of various items of evidence on or about the vehicle or in the vehicle? Yes. Okay. Um, first of all, did you obtain a search warrant to, to, to search the interior of that car? A search warrant was obtained. All right. Now, what did you start off looking for? Based upon, again, we know that you are going to rely on information that's communicated to you from other sources. So as a crime scene investigator, as you approach the processing of this car, what are some of the things we should be looking out for? Okay, well, I know the car was pitted, so number one, I'm going to look for uh, any damage to the vehicle that can cause from the push bar or the uh, deputy's vehicle. Uh, I know the vehicle was shot at, so I'm looking for bullet holes. And when I was uh, photographing the scene out there, I noticed there was a gun on the floorboards inside the car looking through the window. So that's another thing I'm going to be looking for in the search warrant to see anything related to the car. Okay. All right, let's focus on um, your examination of the exterior of the car first, and then we'll move inside. I'm going to show you State's Exhibit 36, and can you tell us what we're looking at of any note in this particular photograph? Yes, that's the uh, driver's door of the vehicle, and particularly there's a, a bullet exit hole on uh, the door handle there. Right in this area? Yes. All right. And you say exit hole. Do you have close-ups of this photograph, of this particular hole? Yes. All right. Let's take a look at State's Exhibit 37. Again, is this a close-up? Yes. Now tell us what it is that, it, we, when we look at this photograph, what is it about it that lets you say or offer an opinion that it is an exit hole? Oh, the metal around the hole is pushed out, uh, so that shows that the bullet came through and it was exiting. Okay, kind of basic common sense? Correct. Did you know that before you went to shooting reconstruction school? Uh, probably. Okay. All right, next I'm going to show you State's Exhibit 38. What are we looking at here? That's an entrance hole, the same hole that you just previously saw. That's a, the end of the door, the driver's door, where the bullet entered. Okay, and we can say that it corresponds with the exit hole because you can see right through it? Correct. All right, I think we have a close-up of that, maybe. State's 39. Is that the hole that we were just referring to? Yes, it is. All right. And State's Exhibit 40, what are we looking at here? That's a nice close-up of the uh, exit hole on the exterior of the driver's door. Okay. So let's talk about, based upon your, your educational background, uh, your experience on the job in reconstruction, in shooting scene reconstruction, do you have an opinion regarding the position of this door at the time this particular bullet hole was occurred, or this bullet defect occurred? Yes, the door would have had to have been open for the bullet to hit the uh, interior portion of it. Do you have an opinion regarding the general flight path of a bullet? That is, was it from front, from the front of the car to the back, or from the back of the car to the front? It would have been from the back of the car towards the front. Right. Let's go to the rear of the vehicle. Showing you states 41. If you could go ahead and tell us kind of what we're looking at here. And that's the rear of the uh, Toyota Corolla. Okay. There's uh, numerous uh, marks on the bumper there, uh, consistent with uh, the pit maneuver. Uh, these over here, and then there's also additional marks here and here, uh, indicating that he probably hit the vehicle more than once. The deputy. Uh, there's also a bullet hole. Okay, let me, let's stop. We're, we're going to get to that in a close-up okay. in a moment. Um, but as it relates to the, the, the pit maneuver, have you seen in your experience cars that have been involved in a, a whatever it be a pursuit or whatever the case might be where a law enforcement officer initiates a pit maneuver? Yes. Okay. And the damage to the left rear of the vehicle here, is that consistent with the kind of damage you might see when a pit maneuver is initiated? Yes. Okay. Approximately. And furthermore, as it relates to what 
these other markings, if you will, on the bumper? Are you familiar with the the bars that you guys have on the front of your car? What do you call them? The push bar? Push bar. All right. And are you familiar, have you seen those used in ramming of vehicles or having had contact with vehicles in the past? Yes. All right. And do those markings appear to be consistent with that as well? Yes, they do. Okay. I think i got to do just a couple close-ups again. All right. Uh, this marking here, and it looks like this came off a little bit. But what, what, what are we looking at here? What, how do you describe that? Well, the push bar has vertical sections of it. And shows you the width of it, so it's all consistent. The mark on the other side is consistent. Push bar is black, vinyl covered or rubber covered. Okay. So the color transfer is consistent with having come from a push bar? That's correct. How about the timing? Obviously, you can't say this happened at 9.42 in the morning, but is there something about the condition of the bumper that would enable you to render some opinion regarding the recency of the... Yes, well, you, you would think that was fairly recent because uh, the, you can see that the bumper is covered in dust and this area is where it was hit. It's, it's clear of dust. Okay. And again, in, indications here and here consistent with some type of contact, correct? That's correct. Now, you had indicated to the ladies and gentlemen of the jury that you observed a bullet defect. Where is that in this photograph? And for the record, you're pointing, this is State Secure 43, I'm sorry, I didn't say that for the record, but State Secure 43, so we're on the left side of the bumper, correct? Correct. All right. And did you find a corresponding strike on the interior or, or in on the other side of that bumper? There's an interior uh, wheel well of the vehicle. There's a uh, dimple on the inside that corresponds. Okay. And as it relates to that, was there ever a projectile find, found associated with that particular bullet strike? No, there was not. How about with with respect to the one to the driver's side door? Did we ever find a fired bullet, a fired projectile or bullet from associated with that? No, we did not. All right. This particular bullet, again, if you based upon considering bullet defect, taking into consideration your education, background, training, experience, do you have an uh, an opinion regarding? the directionality from which this particular strike came. Yes, it would have come from somewhere behind the dart towards the front. Okay. Now, again, as we talk about um, the push bar, I want to show you State's exhibit. It's up there under all the packaging. The jury has looked at this, but when we talked about some of the items that you would take back to the sheriff's office to examine, this is going to be State's Exhibit 35, and this has been identified as Sergeant, excuse me, Deputy Sheriff Sarvis's push bar. Do you recognize this? Yes, I do. Okay. If you could just step here for a moment. When you examine this, thank you very much. When you examine this push bar, did you see, first of all, is it black? It's black. All right, and is that consistent with the color from the defendant's bumper? Yes, it is. All right, and then do you see also red discoloration in here that would be consistent with this push bar having come into contact with a red colored object. Yes, in this area here, there's uh, some slight discoloration, some transfer thing. Okay. Good thing. There also appears to be some damage, if you will, or bending yes, of this particular item. Yes, pushed in this lower section here. It's been pushed in a little bit. Okay. okay. Obviously consistent with coming into contact with a vehicle or something anyways, right? Correct. Okay. Now, what about Sergeant Morales' car? Did you take a look at his push bumper? Yes, we did. In fact, was his entire car preserved? Yes. And to this day is in the condition it was once removed from the scene and after you guys got done processing it. That's correct. Okay. I want to show you some photographs. The first is going to be State's Exhibit 44. When you examine Sergeant Morales' push bar, and I got a close up picture that's going to blow it up. Can you show us? The area on that push bar, which is Sarvis's, there are some like whitish type areas mm -hmm. that would be consistent, do you agree, with the area that transfers black to an object might have come into contact with? Correct. You see, did you see any of that, or do we see any of that on Sergeant Morales' push bar? No, his push bar was fairly clean. I mean, it's, uh, there was no dents or damage to it. Right. No what about red it. paint? Did you see any red paint on his push bar? No. 
I think I have one more, just maybe close up. That was page 44. And again, just as a close up, any indication on this push bar of any contact, any, anything that would link this to the, the damage to the defendant's vehicle. Let me talk to you about that for a moment. Back at the scene, and we're going to get there in a moment, but the scene of the shooting, so the second scene, which we're going to get to your processing of in just a second. As you surveyed that scene, did you find any evidence of broken tag taillights? No. You know, like the red blinker light or the white backup light or the yellow light or anything of that nature? No. Any evidence or indication that Sergeant Morales' vehicle or any other vehicle had had an, a collision there at that scene or come into contact with one another? Nothing whatsoever. Okay, let's move to the uh, inside of the car. First, I'm going to show you States Exhibit 47 and ask you... Uh, Again, is the uh, red tire uh, The driver's door is open, and it's the interior front area. Okay. Did you, did you search the entire interior of the vehicle? Yes, we did. All right. I want to show you States Exhibit 53 in evidence. <coughs> All right. And what I want to draw, obviously, when you examine the car, the, the glove box was closed. Sure. All right. So this is you have opened it to expose the contents of the glove box. Yes. Let me see if I can zoom in here and ask you to describe what that is. That is a nylon holster. Holster, gun holster? Gun holster, okay. If you just approach for a moment, I want to show you stage exhibit 54 and ask you if you recognize that. Yes, I do. Okay. Could you please open it and examine the contents? If I 
to get the lights, and if you, I'll ask you first, do you recognize State's Exhibit 49? Yes, I do. Okay, and if you could please open it and examine the content. You recognize that? Yes, I do. And what is that? That is uh, the gun I uh, collected from the uh, floorboard, right passing the floorboard of the vehicle. Okay, Your Honor, at this time I offer an evidence stage exhibit 49. Objection from the defense. I don't have an objection. I, I will ask that Detective Young try to shield what he's looking at until, until things are introduced, please. I'll admit it as, uh, without objection, states 49 in evidence, we get a card marked. Okay. Now, it's been admitted, it may be published if the state wishes to. Yes, is that in a secure condition? Yes, it's got, okay. it's got a strap on it. Okay. And if you can, for the benefit of the jury, will you describe what type of a firearm this is? It's a Glock uh, Model 30, 45 caliber. Okay. And so when we talk about how you load this firearm, how you use this firearm, how, how do you go about loading a gun of this nature? You would place the magazine into the hand there, okay. and then secure it and pull back the slide to uh, load around into the chamber. All right. Now, we looked at just a moment ago what's in evidence as uh, State's Exhibit. Up here, and maybe to the back. What's at the table? State's Exhibit hold that. 54, which is the holster. Can you demonstrate, can you indicate, does that, does that firearm fit into that holster? Okay. Yes, it does. Okay. Thank you. Now, again, you indicated some of these items you will take from a scene, in this case from the defendant's vehicle, and in this case that gun, and transport it back to be uh, physically processed. Is that correct? That's correct. Right. First of all, did you do anything in an effort to try to secure um, DNA evidence from that particular item? Yes, I did. Prior to processing it, the fingerprints, I uh, swabbed it for DNA. All right. Can you tell the jury how you do that? How do you go about swabbing an item of that nature for DNA? Okay, well, we, take, we have sterile swabs that are in their own packaging. Two swabs, there's a cotton end and it's got about a six inch uh, wooden shaft on it. I take the two swabs out of the package, I will moisten it with distilled water and I will rub the grip area here all around the slide area and the trigger area and I do that for approximately a minute. What we're trying to do is release any skin cells that might be left on the weapon uh, and then after that it's placed, this uh, swabs are placed back in their sleeve, placed into an evidence, uh, evidence envelope and then I give it to the evidence custodian who will send it to the lab. Okay. And so you're kind of swabbing the areas, the, the friction areas, if you will, of the, of the gun, the trigger, the handle, and the slide area. Any place that the weapon would have been touched. Okay. So let me show you. Did, did you do that in this case? Yes, I did. And did you do it just as you explained it to the jury? Yes, I did. All right. I want to show you what's marked as up for identification as State's Exhibit 52. Uh, Ask you if you recognize that. Yes. Okay. And can you tell us what's contained in State's Exhibit 52? It'll be the swabbing of two swabs that I uh, collected from this weapon. Okay, Your Honor, this time the State would offer State's 52 in evidence? No objection. Without no defense objection, be admitted to State's 52 in evidence. Okay, so the swabbings that are contained in State's 52 were taken from the firearm that was recovered from the defendant's vehicle. Is that correct? That is correct. All right. Now, also, you indicated to this jury that when you recovered the firearm, you noted that it was still loaded. Is that correct? That's correct. When you take it back to the uh, sheriff's office again, did you examine the the magazine and, and count the rounds that were in it? Yes. All right. Let me first show you what's been marked as uh, State's Exhibit 50 and just ask you what that is. Okay, this would be the round that I uh, extracted from the uh, chamber of this weapon. Okay, so as the gun lie on the floorboard of the defendant's car, there was a, a round in the chamber? That is correct. And that's what this is? That's correct. Your Honor, at this time the state would uh, offer State's Exhibit 50. Objection. Okay. Without defense objection, be admitted to State's 50 in evidence. And then next, you need that, I'm going to give you this, State's Exhibit 51. You recognize that? Yes, it's a magazine. Okay. And okay. it has two uh, cartridges in it. Okay. 
So there was one in the gun and two remaining in the magazine? That's correct. All right. Your Honor, at this time we'd offer an evidence that you did it 51. That's objection. No, sir. No objection being made to States 51 in evidence. I'd just like you to open States 51 so that we can take a look at that. Two different items in there, is that correct? You can go ahead. That's correct. These, the two, this these, will be, these will be the two rounds that were removed from this magazine. Okay. And for the record, how many rounds does this particular magazine hold? Ten. Ten? Ten. All right. And so if this firearm were to be fully loaded, can you just kind of demonstrate for us how you would do it? Pull the slide back. Pull the slide back. All right. Now, could this could this weapon have a capacity of up to 11 rounds of ammunition? That's correct. Ten in the magazine, one in the chamber. Okay. How would you do that? You would put the magazine in. You would uh, put a place around into the chamber by pulling back the slide. I would pull the magazine back out and, and I'll load another round into the magazine to get this back to ten. Okay. And is that how back when you were in law enforcement, the deputies that are on the road? are able to put 14 rounds in their guns when their magazine only holds 13. Correct. Okay. Thank you. I'm sorry. Sorry about that. <coughs> Your Honor, we have no more uh, questions of the witness at this time. We, we do anticipate calling him uh, back. Mr. Manchu. Good morning, Detective Young. Good morning. The, uh, <coughs> sorry, excuse me. The uh, bullet holes that, that were inside of Mr. Tisdale's car, you said that there was a total of two of them, correct? Correct. If you could, um, now you, you were obviously out there on February 28th. Correct. A few days later on March 1st, did you go back? Go back where? Uh, to the, the scene? scene of Naylor. Yes, sir. Yeah, we went back uh, the next day, March 1st, yes. And on March 1st, did you did you go out there with uh, some equipment as well. Yes. Tell the, tell the jury what, what you brought with you. Well, we bought a bunch of rakes and stuff because we raked the whole of Nailer from uh, the south end uh, of, I think it was 3219 Nailer, uh, where the Sergeant Morales' vehicle was. The south end of that property line all the way to, uh, to the road north of it, which I believe is Canner. Uh, so we raked that, and then I also metal detected uh, a little bit of the uh, area around uh, the shoulder of the, maybe the west shoulder of the nailer. And by, by using the rakes and the metal detectors, what, what specifically were you looking for? Any additional shell casings or projectiles. Now, would the metal detector have, have detected uh, a bullet or projectile? Sure. And were you able to find anything at all? No, we did not. Did you also go to the the south end of Naylor, the intersection of King Orange? No. Did you 
you do any examination of um, any of the houses on the south end at all? No. Can you push the clerk, please? Thank you. I'm showing you states 54. It's the holster, right? Correct. Um, could you please? I imagine this is you have familiarity with the bolsters. A little bit. Yes. <laughs> All right. Um, could you describe what what I'm seeing other than other than just clock? What, what is this? What are the functions of the holster? Okay. This is the holster section here, obviously, is where the gun would go. This here is a magazine holder. Could you hold it up so they can see what you're doing? Where you could stick an extra magazine. Is that a little bit of elastic you too? Yes, it is. Okay. And then that's a belt clip where you can put it onto your belt and hold it on. Discuss the case among yourselves. I'm going to discuss your presence. You can leave your notepads there on your chair for you. They'll be there for you when you come back. Okay. So just watch your steps up and down. Outside the courtroom, all counsel present, including the defendant. Okay, I want to address Ms. Maldonado. Yeah, so this, at this time, the state intends to call Jessica Maldonado. Oh, have a seat. Everybody else. Thank you. Outside the jury's presence, staying in the jury when the jury comes and have them placed under oath, they can have a seat, and when they're done testifying, excuse the jury. Just so the court knows, in case there's some instruction you want to give her ahead of time, if she has some concerns about whether she should answer a question or not, um, we discussed her asking if she can have a, a moment to speak with her attorney. Um, I would say. I mean, if that's the case, then maybe we should send the jury out. I would note she is under subpoena. By virtue of that, she's afforded uh, use and derivative use immunity. State subpoena, right. She's under state subpoena. She is under state subpoena, correct. I have uh, direct running rents. Detective rents served her in my presence. So she is here pursuant to a state issued subpoena. Okay, well, if. Her, her concerns are she's currently right. brought up for resentencing on her case that she's currently incarcerated in. 
that they can see that there was error in the sentencing on just on Friday, the 25th. But the new issue and those concerns she has, and there's also another case that the state has brought against her that they previously dropped that could be resurrected. So I don't foresee anything going into any of those issues, but she has those concerns for her own personal well-being. And for the record, what I would propose is simply to say you are incarcerated on unrelated charges, and we're not here to talk about that. So it's very clear that that's not what we're here on. Okay. Mr. Manchin. I'm, I'm not sure if I'm on the same page with everybody or not. Um, I'm hoping that we're going to be proffering this, um, her testimony first. I, I don't want to have a situation that could trigger a mistrial. Okay. I didn't anticipate proper, but if y'all, if we think we need to, we'll proffer. I don't, I see, you know, she's given prior sworn statements, they've been transcribed, she's been provided them, I have about 15 questions I'm going to ask them, so I, I don't foresee it, but if you want to do it, we can do it, I, I appreciate what, what is it we need to proffer specifically? Um, well, Specifically, what Mr. Backdall is, is intending on asking her, I, I do certainly have some guesses, and uh, I'm going to be objecting to some of what he's guessing he's going to be attempting to introduce. I don't think it's admissible. Okay, I guess you what you want to ask the defense what they think I'm going to ask. It's not admissible. I generally try not to ask questions on inadmissible evidence. So let's. Crawford, and there's only 15 or so questions. It shouldn't take that long. Uh, Crawford, if you can have Ms. Maldonado come in, please. Jessica Gladys Maldonado. And Ms. Maldonado, you're presently incarcerated, is that correct? Yes, sir. And you're incarcerated on charges unrelated to this case, correct? Yes, sir. All right, so we don't want to talk about any related to anything you have pending, okay? Yes, sir. All right, uh, do you know the defendant in this case, Eric Tisdale? Yes, sir. And do you see him here in court? Yes, sir. Okay, and I would ask you to point and describe what he's wearing, but I know you have shackles on now, and we're going to get those removed. But the jury's outside. Court, if you want to have a point now. Can you point to and, de and describe where the defendant is seated and what he's wearing? A gray suit with a gray and red tie. All right. And the record reflect where to point to and describe an article of defense clothing. Yes, sir. Now, what was your relationship, what was the nature of your relationship with the defendant back in February of 2013? My boyfriend. Okay. And were you all living together at that time? Yes, sir. Do you remember where you were living? On Mira Drive. I got a photograph here, Ms. Maldonado, to your right. Um, I don't want you to have to step down, but it's State's Exhibit 8. This is Mira Drive. Do you recognize this location right here? Yes, sir. Is that where you all were living? Yes, sir. Okay. Do you, can you describe that for me? Is it a, is it a, is, was it a duplex, triplex? A quad. Four, so it would mean four different groups of people lived there? Yes, sir. And was it all occupied at the time you were living there? I believe so, yes. And did you know all the people that lived there? Did you know your neighbors? No, sir. Did you know some of them? Yes, sir. Okay. Back in February of 2013, was, do you know if the defendant was employed at that time? No, sir. Okay. Specifically, was he employed the morning of February 28, 2013? No, sir. 
So the next thing I want to do is ask you if you back then in 2013 owned a vehicle. That's eight, six. And I'll put it up here on the screen for you. Hopefully you'll be able to see it. But did you own a vehicle back in uh, February of 2013? Yes, sir. I'm going to show you stage six. Do you recognize that? Yes, sir. Okay, what is that? Our Toyota Corolla 97. Okay. Did, was it actually registered to you or? Yes, sir. Okay, so this is your car? Yes, sir. Did you allow the defendant on that day, February 28, 2013, to drive your car? Yes, sir. Were you aware at that time that his driver's license was suspended? Yes, sir. All right. Let's talk about the morning of February 28, 2013. And um, you both were home that morning, correct? Yes, sir. All right. Did there come a point in time when the defendant left the duplex there on Muir and King Orange? Yes, sir. In your car? Yes, sir. All right. Do you know where he was going? To the corner store. What's the corner store? Where was that? It's on... Um, Are you talking about the 7-Eleven? No, not 7-Eleven. It's in front of the 7-Eleven. Okay, so we're talking about up Oleander overpass by Edwards? Yes. All right. You don't know the name of the store? No. All right. Do you know why he was going to the store? To get me an orange juice. To get you some orange juice? Yes, sir. All right. Back in February of 2013, did you know the defendant to own a firearm that he kept in the car. Yes, sir. Okay, I guess what I would like to say here, Judge, um, is I don't want to talk about all of the firearms recovered from the house. So I'll specifically instruct the victim not to mention anything about the additional guns recovered from the house. I'd ask you to instruct her on that point. Small amount of what they want to focus on is the gun that was alleged to have been found in the car, nothing else. Okay, yes, you sir. understand? Yes, sir. Okay. Glove box. And do you know how he kept the gun in the glove box of your car? The only times I only saw it maybe like maybe a week and a half ago, which was the last time I saw it, and then it was the gun and the magazine, and it was just side by side. Okay. So I didn't hear what she said. It was where? It was in the glove box in the. the seat. Do you remember if he had a holster, kept it in a holster? No, sir. Right, let me show you what's in evidence that states that you have before. This is removed. This has been identified as coming out of your glove box. Does this look familiar? Mm -hmm. I can't remember. Okay. Can you describe the gun for us? What did the gun look like that the defendant kept in your glove box? It was like a, it's black and it was box, box black shape. Black box? Yes, sir. Okay. Did you ever see him holding that gun? Yes, sir. Okay. And when you saw him holding that gun, what was he doing with it? He was just, he, well, it wasn't the gun he was holding, it was the magazine. And I just saw him like once, he took the bullets out and put it back in, but that was it. Okay. Did you ever see him racking the gun or doing something like this with the gun? Yes, sir. Have you ever used the term fire to describe a gun? Remember that term, the fire? Fire? As a fire. street lingo for a gun, fire? Yes, sir. You, you heard of that? Uh, yes, sir. Okay. Let me just show you the state's exhibit 49. This was removed from the floorboard of your car. Does this look familiar? I can't remember, but... I mean, just generally in terms of the boxy nature and the color and so forth, does that look like the gun that's been kept in your car? I'm not sure. I don't know. You don't know if it's that exact gun. But if it were pink, you know it wasn't that gun, right? Yes, sir. Okay, his gun was black? Mm -hmm. Yes, it was. Yes, sir. All right, and if it had a cylinder in it, 
that wouldn't be the same kind of gun, right? Yes, sir. Okay. And this has the box he looked that looked like the gun he had? Yes, sir. Okay. And finally, I'm just going to show you that you, in your prior interview, you talked about the magazine you call a bullet holder. Do you remember that? Yes, sir. Okay. Let me just show you. Does this look like what you call the bullet holder? Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Okay. And did you ever see the defendant inserted that in the gun? No, sir. When the defendant kept the gun in the glove box, can you tell us where the bullet holder was? Got it. What? Beside it. Beside of it, right? Beside it. Okay. Okay. That's the extent of her testimony. I wish to question the proper. Um, well, I don't have any questions for her right now, but just to, I, I do have a relevancy objection as to her, her observation of the gun and the magazine being separate inside the glove box a week and a half prior to, to this happening. She, she said that she only saw it once, and this is a, a once in the car, and this is a week and a half beforehand. It, it's almost as if they're, they're trying to show that this was a habit, that that's how he always kept the gun. And I would also argue this is impermissible uh, habit. So relevancy and added. Okay. Mr. Bagadol. Obviously it's relevant, uh, the fact that they, he kept the murder weapon in his car. Uh, uh, I might point out that her, in her previous testimony, in her previous statements to law enforcement, when discussing the gun, uh, her first statement at page 7, line 281, Uh, they asked her, so he always leaves it in the car, okay, so if he were to go to the store, he'd probably have the car with him, yeah, probably because it's in the glove box. And then she's asked, okay, is that pretty much where he leaves it all the time, is in the glove box? And she says, mm-hmm. So, again, um, I'll probe that more in detail with her during her testimony in the presence of the jury, but she's basically saying the defendant leaves the murder weapon in the car, that the magazine is out of the gun, I think that's relevant because what that shows is another step in the process that well, Sergeant Morales is fixing to pull him over, not only is the gun not loaded, but the magazine isn't in it. And at some point in time in this encounter, he has to take the magazine, insert it in the gun, and load it. And I think it goes to the weight of uh, the testimony, not the admissibility of it. It's certainly relevant on an issue of, of premeditation that she says when she sees it, it's not loaded. It's kept unloaded or the magazine is out of it. So I think that's highly relevant. Right, she didn't see it the day this incident occurred? No, she did not see it. She said he always kept it in the car. Right. Mr. Manship, any other comment on your objection? Well, even in the, the answer to the line that you just read, okay, so it's pretty much where he leaves it all the time is in the glove box, and then we see two M's, an H, and an M, and we're, we're also supposed to assume that that's, that's an affirmative yes. Um, again, she, she just told us a few minutes ago that she only saw it in the glove box once. Uh, so how, how that's supposed to establish that that's what Mr. Tisdale's habit is, which is what it appears that Mr. Backdall's argument is, is, is beyond me how you have a habit after one circumstance. And again, this was one and a half weeks prior to the shoot. And uh, I, I think that that's a, a really far stretch for them to, to jump in. Okay. Just bear with me just a minute. We'll go off the record. If I might, I'd like to supplement the, the record. And I'd like to approach, if I may, Ms. Maldonado, um, and just show you your uh, initial statement to law enforcement and just see if this was uh, given the day of the, of the homicide. You see here, page 7. Line, starting at line 272, reading through 276. Okay. And so you're, you indicated that you, quote, always left it in the car, right? 
from the time I saw it, yes. Okay. I didn't always look for it. It was the only time I saw it, that's where it was. It was always in the car. You always left it in the car. Is what you Whenever said. I saw it, that's where it was. Uh, any, Mr. Mitchell, any other comment on your objection? No, sir. State any other comment? No, sir. Right, just bear with me just a minute. I'll go off the record and make a decision here just a minute.
record, all counsel present. Mr. Tisdale is present. The court has heard and considered the proper testimony of Ms. Maldonado outside the presence of the jury, of course. Heard the defense objections and the state's comments to the defense objections. Defense objects for two grounds. One, this testimony is not relevant, and second, doesn't establish sufficiently habit evidence. Summarizing Ms. Maldonado's testimony, and I emphasize I'm summarizing it a bit, she testified she and Mr. Tisdale lived in a quadruplex, that's the appropriate word, on the Mira Drive street on the day in question. She testified on the day in question that Mr. Tisdale left the home in a red Toyota Corolla that's registered to her. She said he was going to a nearby market to get her some orange juice. She has seen the defendant with a gun that resembles the gun that was entered into evidence, alleged to have been found in the red Toyota on the day of the incident. She testified Mr. Tisdale kept a gun in the glove box, at least the only time she saw it, it was kept in the glove box. She also saw it next to what she characterized as bullet holders, that is magazines for the gun, were next to it in the glove box when she saw it. She testified it was about a week and a half she last saw the gun prior to the incident in the glove box. She didn't see it there the day in question. She has also seen the defendant loading the bullets into what she described as bullet holders or magazines. In considering this testimony, I find this testimony sufficiently relevant to admit into evidence. Therefore, I need not address the defense objection on the habit issue. The defense objection, in my view, goes to the weight. If any, the jury may assign this testimony. Of course, the defense may cross-examine her about this testimony in front of the jury, and they may give it what weight, if any, they consider appropriate. So I'll overrule the defense objection. This testimony is proper and is admissible in front of the jury. Now, Ms. Graves, do you want to advise her if she feels there's an issue she needs to talk to you about to let me know? Okay. Do you understand that, ma'am? Yes, sir. Any questions about any of that? No, sir. Okay. All right. Can we take the handcuffs off of her? Please. Ms. Maldonado, just so you know, when the jury comes back in, I'll ask you just to please stand and raise your right hand. One of these nice ladies here will administer the oath to you again in their presence. Then you can just go ahead and have your seat. When the lawyers are done asking you questions, I'll send the jury back out of the courtroom, and then you can step down. Yes, sir. You understand? Yes, sir. And if you feel there's some issue that comes up and you want to speak with Ms. Graves, if you'll turn to me and ask if you could take a break, we'll do so. Yes, sir. You understand? Yes, sir. Do you have any questions about any of that? No, sir. Okay. Just make sure you speak up, Ms. Maldonado. Okay, kind of quiet. You're probably nervous, so just make sure you speak up so we can hear you and get you on the record. Yes, sir. Okay. Mr. Bagdall, are you ready to have him come in? I am, Your Honor. Mr. Bentz, ready to have him come in? Yes, sir. Okay. Mr. Riles, I think we're ready. Mr. Bagdall, when they come in, if you'll just announce you call her as a witness and say her name. Yes, sir. Good morning, Your Honor. 
Okay, thank you all very much for bearing with us. I'm sorry for the interruption. I appreciate your patience and your attention. Take all your next fitness, please. Your Honor, at this time, the people of the state of Florida will call the judge to come all and out. Small out, if you please stand and raise your right hand. Do you swear from the evidence you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. You can have a seat. Just make sure you speak up for us. Good morning. Could you please introduce yourself to the ladies and gentlemen of the jury? Jessica Maldonado. And Ms. Maldonado, could you please spell your last name for them? M-A-L-D-O-N-A-D-O. -A -A now, Ms. Maldonado, you're presently incarcerated, is that correct? Yes, sir. And that has no, that's not related to this particular case, correct? No, sir. All right. Now, do you know the defendant in this case, Therese Tisdale? Yes, sir. Could you point to him? Do you see him here in court? Yes, sir. Could you point to him and describe an article of his clothing for the ladies and gentlemen of the jury? The gray jacket with the gray and red tie. And you're on a direct way of like witness point to describe an article of the defense clothing? Yes, sir. What was the nature, Ms. Maldonado, of your relationship with the defendant back in February of 2013? That's my boyfriend. And were you all living together at that time? Yes, sir. And do you remember where you were living back in February of 2013? On Mira Drive. So to the left, to the right of you, ma'am, you can just remain in your seat. It states Exhibit A. This is a giant, a, a, an aerial photograph of the Silver Lake area. Here is Mira. Do you see where your residence is on that, a map? Yes, sir. Where? Down by the small house. house. Yes, sir. Okay. What kind of a building is that? Do you remember? It's a quad apartment okay. complex. So there are three other apartments other than the one occupied by you and the defendant. Yes, sir. All right, and were they occupied at the time in, back when you all were living there? I can't remember if all of them were. Okay, but were some of them? Yes, sir. And did you know some of the occupants of those uh, dwellings? Some, yes. All right. Now, in February of 2013, was the defendant employed? No, sir. And specifically February 28th of 2013, was the defendant employed? No, sir. When you and the defendant were living together, together at that uh, residence in the corner of King and Mira, did you own a vehicle? Yes, sir. And what kind of a vehicle was it? It was like a maroon Toyota Corolla okay. and 97. Who, to whom was the car registered? Do you remember? Me. All right. I'm going to show you stage exhibit six and ask you if you recognize that car. Yes, sir. Okay. What is that a picture of? My car. That's your car? Yes, sir. The morning of February 28, 2013, did you own this car? Yes, sir. And did the defendant uh, ask to use your car, or did the defendant use your car that morning? Yes, sir. Were you aware that the defendant on February 28, 2013, had a suspended license? Yes, sir. All right. Let's talk about, as best as you can remember, do you remember approximately what time the defendant left your house that morning? Is in between 9.30 and 10. Do you know where he was going? To the, to the corner store. All right, so when you say the corner store, can you tell them what, what's the name of the corner store? I don't know the name of the corner store. I know it's right in front of the 7-Eleven, and it's like a gas station. Okay, so. so we're talking about, if you look at this map again, if we come up Oleander, there's like Edwards runs here, and then there's like a gas station, Cumberland Farms, and a 7-Eleven right over the railroad tracks. Is that what you're talking about? Yes, sir. Okay, so it would be from here, one of these directions, to some location up here. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Going back to February 28th of 2013, did you know the defendant to keep a firearm in your car? Yes, sir. Can you tell the jury where he kept that gun in your car? In the glove box. I want to show you what's been... First of all, I'd ask you to... You were interviewed by law enforcement back when this incident occurred, correct? Yes, sir. And they asked you about this gun, right? Yes, sir. And you offered some descriptions. How, did you, how do you describe the gun that you saw the defendant uh, with that he kept in the glove box. How do you describe it? Black and box shape. Black and box shape. Do you remember saying anything else about the gun or how it operated or what, you know, how the bullets were loaded? Do you remember that? I remember saying the top slide. slide. Okay. And do you remember talking about something you call a bullet holder? Yes, sir. All right. What, describe what a bullet holder is. 
it holds the bullets. <laughs> okay, but it's like, so what we now call a magazine, right? Yes, sir. Right. Have you ever heard the term fire when you're referring to a gun? Fire? Fire, yes. Fire? Yes. Okay. <laughs> but slang for a gun, fire, right? Is that yes? Yes, sir. Okay. So this is an evidence that states exhibit 49. I want to ask you to look at it. When you look at it, obviously, you have no idea whether or not this is the gun, the exact gun you saw, right? Yes, sir. But as it relates, is it the same color? Yes, sir. All right. Is it the same boxy look? Yes, sir. All right. And along with that, it states 51. Do you recognize this? Yes, sir. What does that look like? The magazine. Okay, or the bullet holder. bullet holder, right? Were there occasions when you saw this gun where the defendant was holding the bullet holder and taking bullets out and putting bullets in? Yes, sir. How many times do you think you saw him doing that? Once, maybe twice. Okay. When the defendant kept the black boxy gun in the glove box, where was the bullet holder? Beside it. Beside it? Yes, sir. Okay. So the gun was unloaded? When it was in the glove box? The time I saw it, yes, sir. Okay. When you say the time you saw it, do you recall giving a statement to law enforcement um, back on the 28th of February 2013? Yes, sir. Okay, I just want to show you and see if this refreshes your recollection. And for the defense, it's going to be at page uh, 14, um, line 614. Uh, through 618, but feel free to read as much in front or behind or all around as you want. But I just want to reference you to here. Take your time, 614 to 618. Mm -hmm. Okay. So when asked if you recall seeing the bullet holder or the magazine, do you recall saying it was, quote, always laying next to it in the glove box? Yes, yes sir. Okay. When asked if you were air is, right? Yes, sir. Like the air we breathe and is. Air is? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, all right. I want to start right where the uh, prosecutor just finished, which was you were saying that, that uh, it was that the magazine was always next to the to the gun inside the glove box. So by always, is that encompassing your your total time of seeing it in the glove box at the once, maybe twice? Yes, sir. So it, it's not like this is something that you would see every day. No, sir. You wouldn't go in your glove box every day? No, sir. And by once, maybe twice, that sounds relatively infrequently, right? Yes, sir. And when approximately was the, the once, maybe twice in relation to when all this happened? It was like a week and a half ago before. So you have no idea how the how or, or where the gun was being kept that day that all this happened. No, sir. Yes, sir. 
and um, you said that he was going to the store for you. Why? Um, well, let me ask you this. Were you pregnant at the time? Yes, sir. And was this Eris' baby? Yes, sir. And how far along were you? Eight months. All right. I want to... Um, I want to talk to you about um, your car and, uh, and your license. So the, the Toyota Pro was, was your car, right? Yes, sir. And it was registered to you? Yes, sir. And your registration was up to date? Yes, sir. And how about your insurance? I found out later that it wasn't okay. once everything happened. Okay. But your registration was still good? Yes, sir. Uh, had you, at that point, had you gotten anything in the mail saying, uh, oh, we're going to suspend your license because you don't have uh, proper insurance on the car? No, sir. And your license was actually good, yes, right? Yes, sir. And it was, it was good and fine on February 28, 2013? Yes, sir. Did you happen to have any warrants out for your arrest on February 28, 2013? No, sir. I'm assuming that you know how to drive it. Yes. <laughs> All right. Um, okay. So we were we were seeing photos. Maybe push the clerk there. inside of my car. Okay. And I have to ask you, because this may not be obvious to everybody, okay? What is this thing right here? The, the stick shift, the, the clutch, I guess. Okay. Clutch. Okay, well, all right. What, what are these three things down here inside of the driver's foot well? It's the gas, the brakes, and the, the clutch. All right. So which, which one's which? This is the clutch, and this is the gear shifter. All right, so you're pointing to the far pedal on the left. Is yes, the clutch, sir. Yes, sir. And the middle one's the brake. Yes, sir. And the one on the right is the gas. Yes, sir. And this thing that's in the, the center console right here is what is how you actually change gears. Yes, sir. All right, so take us through, because some people don't know. Most Americans drive automatic cars. How how do you actually go about driving this car? Let's say you're, you're stopped at a stop sign, mm -hmm. and um, we are leaving a parking lot. How do you actually make the car move? The, tell, me, tell me mechanically what's required to make this car move. You have to start it in first gear, and you have to, like, press down on the clutch and ease off the clutch and press the gas. Okay, so by time. starting off on first gear, what? how do you put the car into gear? With, you just shift it up to first gear. Okay, so you have to you have to take this gear gear shifter yes, that's, that's sticking up, and you have to move it and and put it into a specific area, right? Yes, sir. And that engages first gear. Yes, sir. And you have to have the clutch pedal press all the way down yes, in sir. order to do that. Yes, sir. All right, and then to actually make the car start to go forward, do you have to slowly release the clutch pedal and and slowly go on the the gas at the same time. Okay, so once uh, once first gear starts to to run out, you can't you can't drive to 100 miles an hour in first gear. Right? No, no, sir. All right, so you have to you have to change gears, right? Yes, sir. How do you? By mass clutch, I'm, you're talking about pushing first, the clutch yes, in. Yes, sir. And then once the clutch is in, you then take the gear selector and you move it to a different gear. Yes, right? sir. And then you ease off of the clutch. Yes, sir. And, and then you can press on the gas again, right? Yes, sir. All right. Okay. 
your memory here. Could you just take a look? Sir? I can't see what you're I know, I know. Okay. okay. you turn into? The parking lot. The parking lot. And um, in order to turn into your parking lot, if you were coming, if you were coming south on Europe, and if you were to turn into your parking lot, <coughs> which, which direction would you be turning? And your parking lot is very, very, very close to the intersection of King Orange and Mira. Mm -hmm. So, do you have any idea how many of the units weren't occupied? I think. Four. How many spots does that leave back there? Four. Four spots that somebody who wanted to come into your driveway could have just parked or even just pulled anywhere in there, correct? Right? Quickly with them outside else presence. I'm sorry for the interruption. Bear with us just a few minutes. Let me have you step into your jury room back there. You can leave your notepads there on the seat.